चल के Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, so I'm Chris Johnson here at EPCC. Um, so please, please let us know if you have any problem, any problem uh, uh, seeing or seeing more importantly or hearing, or hearing us, seeing the slides. Slide. Um, um, you can, can either, either um, uh, interject, uh, interject uh, mostly by putting a microphone on, or you can just write something in the chat. So one of us who's not speaking at a particular time will keep an eye on the chat. Um, in terms of questions, there'll be plenty of time for questions. Um, if you have any burning questions, then feel free just to write them into the chat as uh, we go along. Um, otherwise, um, there will be a point during the middle uh, where we'll take questions, and then we'll have an open session at the end where we'll take questions. Uh, so I will just hand over to my colleague, Lorna Smith, who's going to start off, and then I'll take over about halfway through. Uh, so, Lorna, off you go. OK. Thank you, Chris. So I'm going to talk about um, the process involved in submitting an ECSE, and then Chris will talk a wee bit about what happens once you complete it, once your project has been successfully approved. So the first thing to say is this, is an, this gives you an overview of the ECSE and tells you a little bit about the objectives. Now, for those of you who haven't come across the ECSEs before, this is a program that provides funding to our Archer user community to develop software in a sustainable manner for Archer. There's a couple of objectives, um, and I do mention these because this is one thing the panels do look at. They do make sure that your proposal is within scope of the objectives. So one is to sustain key codes for the UK computational science community, and the other is to facilitate the efficient use of Archer um, through enhanced code performance and functionality. So it's about optimizing codes for Archer, and it's about ensuring um, important codes for our community are sustained on Archer and beyond. One of the things about the ECIC program um, is that it's a not-for-profit service. So we have a commitment to provide a certain number of uh, FTEs per year. But any additional money that's left in the budget will be recycled into further ECSE funding. Um, in addition to that, there's a couple of things that have, um, the EPSRC and therefore ourselves are keen to encourage. And one is to encourage applications from codes uh, from new communities or new areas. And the other is a general thing across the Archer services that we want to support and encourage early career researchers. So there are three regular calls per year, and they will be regular. There's no reason to, there's outline timetables on the web, and unlike in the DCSEs, they will happen at a re, on a regular basis. And um, we're currently at the third call, and this closes uh, on the 16th of September. So it's a very good time if you're thinking of submitting one. Um, so most of the projects will be for between three and 12 months. If there's a compelling case for it to be longer, that is OK. But it really has to have a strong justification. The panel will look quite closely at those sort of applications. Um, and I've mentioned not-for-profit. I didn't mention the actual figure. Um, we're committed to 14 FTEs per year of funding. One of the questions that's already come up uh, is about what's permitted in terms of um, new algorithms. So the implementation of new functionality or algorithms is absolutely permitted as part of this, the, uh, the program, although the actual development of these algorithms, basically the research, is not. So it's about implementation. It's about the software. This gives you an overview of the process, what actually happens. So when the call opens, we, the CSE team, are here, and we can offer any guidance that you need. So I'd advise you, if you have any questions, to really do this before submission. Once the call closes, a series of technical reviews are carried out. And from those, you'll find that you'll receive a series of questions potentially asking for further information. The applicants are then given, um, I think it's a week to 10 days, to respond and provide that further information. And then all of that is sent on to the panel for review. 
the re uh, applications are reviewed by two independent panel members and then we have a panel meeting where the proposals are all ranked and uh, an agreed set are, are chosen for funding. We then supply feedback and the results to people. So I'll give you a wee bit more detail on that in the coming slides. Um, we do now use the SACE system. If you're all Archer users, you will be familiar with the SACE. So applications are submitted through the SACE. And there's also information and guidelines on the, um, on the website about all this. And again, if you have any questions, we strongly encourage you to ask them in advance of submission and send it to the, the help desk. So you'll need to specify the technical effort that you require in person months. You specify that you might have more than one person involved in the project, but you specify um, the time in person months. And the vast majority of people will use um, the SET costing rate. So it's exactly the same as the costing rate you would use for a standard EPSERC uh, grant proposal. So you'll be asked to just note the amount for 100% SEC and then we would pay 80% SEC for any successful project. Um, if you're applying for an ECSE which um, uses uh, effort from the centralised team, you don't need to specify the cost, that's all dealt with for you. Um, and there's another point here that in the application, you should note any existing funding funding um, for the technical candidate for the candidates, um, and also any funding related to the codes that you're working on. The point here is the panel are keen to understand that there's no double counting going on; that the work isn't funded, say, by a CCP already. Travel funding: we pay appropriate travel funds for technical staff to travel within the UK. So, for example, um, travel costs to go and meet COIs or PIs is absolutely acceptable. We don't pay for travel to international conferences, and we don't normally pay for travel for PIs and COIs, unless there's exceptional circumstances. So, in terms of the review process, there's two stages to the review process. There's the technical reviews and then there's the panel reviews. We'll go through those. So the technical review, um, the, first of all, a series of administration checks are carried out um, to ensure that everything's there. And then the, your, your application is reviewed by a series of technical advisors. Now, these technical advisors are generally from the ECSE team. Um, but if there's a conflict of interest, so for example, if a proposal um, it's been submitted by someone from the University of Edinburgh, then the proposal would be reviewed by one of our external advisors who are from out with the university. From this, you should receive um, some feedback. What the feedback is is really a series of questions or requests for further information. So we look to see if anything's lacking. And you'll be given the opportunity to respond um, normally within a week to that request for further information. You don't get the opportunity to update the proposal, but you are given the opportunity to actually respond. All that is submitted via the SAE, and then all that information is supplied to the panel. So the panel is able to see what sort of information was asked for and what's been provided. If, the, if at this stage you feel that it, uh, you wish to withdraw the application, that that's no problem, you can withdraw it and resubmit it at a later date. So once this has all been done, um, each application is reviewed by two panel members and the panel members are chosen from um, across the UK and indeed from Europe and um, are all experts in HPC. They're reviewed independently prior to the meeting. That review is done based on the assessment criteria, which I'll mention in the next few slides. And usually you'll find the panel meeting takes place around eight weeks after the call closes. Obviously that varies slightly depending on people's availability, but that's the aim. 
Um, and the panel members can decide to fund an application, to not fund an application, or indeed they can decide to fund something in part. So if they feel that one part of the work plan isn't appropriate, they may choose to fund um, part of the submission. They can also ask for extra activities or extra place extra requirements on um, the application. And conflicts of interest in the panel are handled in the usual way, um, the same way as EPSRC handle this. So it very much depends on what the conflict of interest is. But if a panel member, for example, is a co-I or a PI on a proposal, they wouldn't be involved in that whole ECSE, so they wouldn't be involved in the panel meeting or any assessment. So going through the assessment criteria, the track record of the applicants is noted. Now this is quite important. One of the things that the panel do look at is they look to see whether the applicant, the technical member of staff named, is able to perform the work. Now if the member of staff isn't you know, is relatively inexperienced, they will then look to see whether the, the experience of the co-I's and PI's is there to, to support that member of staff. And they'll also be looking to see that if the member of staff needs training, that's been thought about. So there's an appropriate support plan in place. Obviously, they'll be looking at the technical content. Um, they'll be looking to ensure that there's enough information there to make the uh, to make them confident that the work can be completed. That's one of the main roles of the technical reviewer is to look at the technical content. And benefits. So the benefits are important. Why do you need to do this work and what are the expected benefits? And I'll mention this, but one of the things that has let some projects down is um, a lack of information on what's going to happen to the software afterwards. So who's going to use it? And what, is it going to be available? Is it going to be available on Archer? Who's going to be able to access it on Archer? There's a pathway to impact, which again is looking at the potential impact from the activities that you're you're doing, um, and you know that's obviously quite important. There's a work plan which breaks down the different tasks um, and looks at how the project's going to be managed and how the project's going to be resourced. And then there's a look at the overall quality and fit to the objectives of the ECSD programme. So a couple of things um, just really to point out. Um, it's important to, to note the specific benefit to the Archer community. So once you've done this work, will the code be available in Archer? And who is it going to be available to on Archer? Uh, what sort of licensing does it have? You know, is there a cost associated with the license? Can Archer users use this for free? That's important. And the other thing is who will utilize the improvements? So a number of proposals have letters of support from scientists making it clear that they need this improvement, this functionality, um, to benefit their work. Travel, as I say, we'd normally only fund travel for the technical members of staff. We'll fund travel within the UK, so travel to meet PIs. Sometimes we'll fund, if it's appropriate, we'll fund travel to collaboration meetings, um, but we wouldn't normally fund travel to conferences. The staffing experience and profile is important. The panel do take this into account, um, and they will also look at the experience of the PIs and co-Is and uh, ensure that they can actually support the people involved. And then, as I mentioned before, we'll look at existing funding um, to ensure that it's, there's no double counting going on. We're looking to ensure that the work is not already funded. So if, for example, the code's involved in a CCP, um, it's important to make it clear that this goes beyond the scope of the CCP. So once the decisions have been made at the panel meeting, uh, you should receive your final decision um, with feedback, usually within around two weeks after the panel meeting. Chris will talk a little bit about what happens with successful applications. With unsuccessful, unsuccessful applications, um, there will be feedback provided, all of which will be constructive. And um, if appropriate, you'll be contacted by the CSE team to offer further advice and support in the preparation of a resubmission. 
So the ECSE people will have been at the panel meeting and often can provide more insight into, into that feedback. So that is a run through of the submission process for ECSE. I think at this point it'd be useful to ask if anybody has any questions. I have one. Okay, so. <laughs> uh, go, go okay, go for it, Dan. So you, you can so you type can it into the chat, into if, the you chat if you want. Try, try, uh, try again at, try the, end. at the end. Okay, so I think everyone can see that, but it says, could you comment on the difference between scientific, computational, and archer community benefits? You mentioned a little bit, but please elaborate. So first of all, archer community benefits, that, as it implies, is about benefit to the archer community, so benefit to the users of the archer system. So this is really, um, is the code going to be on archer? How is it going to be made available on Archer? And are there any restrictions to the users of Archer to use that? Um, so you know, it's about committing to uh, update whatever version, of whatever the code is on Archer, make sure it's up to date and contains that information. It's also beneficial if it's going to be disseminated at relevant user meetings, that sort of thing. Scientific benefits are really where letters of support come in. So this is, you know, if you've created, added new functionality to a code, who's going to use it? Is there a user group, um, either your own user group or user groups beyond your own group uh, that will be able to use that functionality? And if so, what sort of science are they going to achieve from it? So what can they do that they couldn't do before, for example? It's very much moving towards the impact side of things. The computational side of things is are, there, are you bringing any benefits to the computational community in general? So is there anything, is there new functionality that could be extended to other codes? Is the work you're doing maybe relevant beyond the code you're working on? And if so, how are you going to ensure the HPC community sees that? Is there benefits around sustainability as well? So I think that's the, the three differences. And as I say, the one that um, we found has been the biggest issue so far is that people haven't focused enough on the benefits to Archer. Uh, and so we've tried to improve the guidance on that, but uh, you know, it's worth taking that into account. OK, I hope that answers your question. Is there any other questions? No, I don't think so. So I'll hand over to Chris. Yep. Okay. okay. Thanks very much. Um, oh, actually, I see there was just another question come came in. Um, I don't. I can't read that. Um, uh, I have another I have question. Another question. Oh, so the funding, the funding will be provided for, for optimising the existing code, code to make more, more efficient, efficient use of Archer, code implementation for proposed algorithms, both. Okay, so I think what you're asking, you cannot be, you cannot use them, you cannot obtain ECSE time to actually develop um, or to do the research around developing an algorithm. But yes, implementing an existing algorithm is fine. So yes, auto, both, are, both are fine. As I say, it's not about research, but it, um, both option one and two are absolutely fine. Okay. 
Thanks. Okay, so I'll just move on a little bit to talk about uh, what happens uh, should your project uh, be accepted. Um, so, just thought I'd run through some of the basic the way that we run the projects. Um, the reason for this is because once your project is accepted, uh, there are a few things that ha um, happen quite quickly. So um, we thought it would be quite useful just to run through them now. And this also might help when you're preparing your proposal because you might you, you hope you get a feel for uh, about how the project actually runs and, and what we do. So I'll basically run through the first stage, which is contracts, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about. Um, the fact that we give you some CPU hours to go along with your project, um, and then a bit more about how we actually run the project in terms of contract, um, monitoring the project, and the, the reports and the obligations that, that you will have as PIs or as, as technical staff. Uh, so first of all, I'll just talk a little bit about contracts. I won't go into loads of details because contracts aren't very interesting. Um, but soon after the projects are accepted, uh, we send out a, a draft contract um, in principle, this is a three-way uh, contract, a three-way document, um, although in some cases it may only be two-way. Um, so we should point out that um, when it comes to staffing ECSE projects, um, you may choose to use um, some postdocs from your own institution, or you may ask for time from, say, EPCC's centralized uh, uh, CSE team, or you may ask for time from staff from a third party institution, or it may be some combination of, uh, of all of the above. So uh, we need a contract that uh, reflects that. So, so in principle, these contracts are three-way between us, the University of Edinburgh, between the institution of the PI and the institution of what we call the consultant, which is um, basically where the technical staff is. Um, and the, the reason I mention this is because the contract is actually between institutions. Um, rather than, say, between the PI and EPCC, it's actually between University of such and such and University of Edinburgh. Um, we can actually provide a separate document uh, if you need, say, an award letter or something like that. Um, and this usually involves uh, legal teams and contract management. So the reason I mention that is because it's sometimes worth priming these people. If, if you um, if, if submit, uh, uh, submit an ECSE proposal, it's worth finding out sort of in advance like who your legal team or contract management actually are so that once the project is accepted, um, you can, we can quite quickly get sorted out with um, uh, getting a contract agreed and signed. And this document includes uh, things like the work plan, which we take straight from your proposal. Um, it, it talks about the level of funding that was awarded, um, agreed start dates, and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, so far, we've, uh, we've managed to set up contracts with, uh, you know, with all the parties, and it hasn't been a, a problem. So um, usually, these things can be done quite quickly. Um, so if your project is successful, then you are awarded uh, 50 killer AUs per staff month awarded. So as an example of that, if you had a three-month project, uh, you'd get 150 uh, killer AUs, and that's equivalent to about 10,000 well, equivalent to 10,000 core hours on Archer. Um, so, um, just checking if I got my factors correct. Um, that must be 10. Sorry, it's 10. That must be 10 million, isn't it? Sorry, um, 150,000. No, that's no, that's right. No, sorry, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, you can request more in your proposal, um, but you have you actually have to ask for it within your proposal, and you have to uh, you'd have to actually justify it, and that may or may not be accepted by the panel. Um, but the 50 killer AUs per staff month is the default amount that you get. It's important to realise that these these CPU hours can only be used for your ECSE work. Um, not for anything else. So you have a, a separate project for each ECSE, um, and we make the, the PI of that project the, the PI of the ECSE. Um, for those of you who already use Archer, you'll, you'll sort of know how this works already. Um, as, uh, once, once the project started, we assign a contact from the centralized uh, CSE team. Uh, they'll be in touch early on in the project, um, and you can just you, you'll discuss the project with them um, and how you know, report any technical problems. And basically, they just provide a point of contact um, for sort of dealing with reports and things like that. Um, so as the projects go on, obviously we, we like to monitor how these are all working. 
Um, so on the sort of more formal side, uh, we ask for a quarterly report uh, for each project. The project runs for more than three months. Um, this is a fairly lightweight document. This is where you, you, um, you report effort and things. In fact, I've got a slide in a minute where I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we also um, expect you to engage with the Archers community. So this is to come along to uh, um, things like the tech forum, virtual tutorials, um, training courses when they happen, um, things like that. Um, on completion, uh, we, uh, we have a final report, which and we send out templates for this. Um, and we also ask that you give an Archer webinar, um, sort of quite similar to what's happening now, basically. It's an, a, a virtual, sort of a virtual um, presentation. Um, now, your, your quarterly reports are not sort of assessed, as it were. We just look at those just to check how things are going. And it's a, it's a point where you can, um, you can just say what, what effort you, you've used and any problems. But, but the final report is reviewed by a combination of the technical advisors and the ECSE panel members. And then we provide you with a feedback um, by the P PI and technical staff with feedback. You don't get a, a mark as such. It's just um, you just get, get, you know, get a report, a little sort of co few comments about, um, about the project. So just to talk a little bit more about, about the report. So the quarterly report is, is very lightweight. It's required for um, each project if it runs for more than three months. You just uh, report the efforts that spent to date. Um, we, we use the track model, so this is where we see a, a full-time um, FEC for a year is equivalent to um, 220 days, where each day is defined to be 7.5 hours. Um, it just, it's worth mentioning that now, just because it's, it's worth thinking about a little bit when, um, when you uh, put in your proposal, because you obviously need to know what it means to ask for you know, three staff months. Well, that, that kind of tells you what, what we really mean by, by a day or you know, a year or so on. And so within the quarterly report, um, you basically could report on any staffing issues which have affected the, the effort spend. Um, then other than that, we just ask for the main achievements to date, any exceptions, um, what the software outputs are so far, um, technical staff engagement, so that's engagements with, um, with the Archer community, but um, we also ask for, for dissemination, so anything more sort of outward facing um, where you might have given a presentation or a seminar, um, that sort of thing. Um, then at the end, as I say, we ask uh, for a final report. This is basically just to, to assess the, the, the success of the, prob uh, the project. Um, uh, we also use this for publicity uh, purposes. Um, basically, I want to highlight the computational advances, um, you know, all the sort of scientific advances, um, potential impact, and the current impact. So anything that's the, any impact that the project has had to date, or what the expected impacts are in the sort of near and, and distant future, um, we put uh, we, this report is still fairly short. We put tight limits on each section because we want it to be quite concise. Um, the report as a whole is not published, but there will be a section which we which we will state to be um, publishable. Um, so you'll know you'll know which bits can be made public and which won't, um, and you'll also um, We'll ask for sort of availability of the code or anything that you've developed, and, and that will have to go into the report. And then you'll you'll say what the technical benefits, impact, engagement, and so on. Is. So that was uh, all I intended to say. There was uh, just one thing I think we didn't mention that I suddenly thought of. Um, in terms of when the projects would actually start, um, we expect that projects um, should start within between three to six months after the closing date of the call. So just to bear that in mind. It, it, this is all in the guidelines, but um, I think it was one thing that we didn't say during the talk. Um, so just so you can get an, an idea of um, time scales and so when we'd be expecting to start. And that usually gives long enough to sort of get the contract set up um, and you know, sort of get, get set up and started. Um, so that was uh, all we had in terms of Sort of more formal slides, uh, but we'd just like to open questions it up to questions now, questions now um, and you can ask, just ask, ask anything, ask anything like you'd like. like. Either put your, you put your microphone, put your microphone on, on and, and say it, or just write chat into the and chat, and we'll try and uh, coordinate, coordinate answers. answers. Yeah. yeah, so uh, just go for it. Alan, did you have a question? Will the review panel be largely technical experts, scientific experts, or a mixture of both? 
Okay, so technical experts do um, the technical evaluation, but the technical but they are not part of the selection process. So the selection process involves only the panel members, and these people are are picked from a a broad spectrum. They're normally scientists who have HPC experience, so they're um, computational scientists. But we do have some members of the panel who are also um, what you might describe technical HPC experts. Does that answer your question, Alan? Thank you. Oh, was that? Uh, no, Dan, uh, oh, okay. Sorry, Dan. Um, I thought that was Alan. Do we have any other questions? Thanks, Gavin. Will the recording of this presentation be available online later? Yes, it will. Assuming yeah. Chris has managed to record it correctly. Yes, I pressed press the recording button, but I'm going to have a recording, recording and we'll move we'll online. Yeah. Yeah. So we have we another have question. question. It, it, people can, can speak, speak if they, if they wish. It's just somebody, somebody had trouble with their microphone. Their microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the question from Maurice: How are contracts drawn up at the University, University of Edinburgh? The only, the only institution involved. involved. Um, um, yes. Yeah, so yeah, I, I didn't go into all the details, the details about all the, all the, all the combinations, combinations of, um, um, of, 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 of parties involved. involved. Is the University, the University of Edinburgh only only involved? And we don't actually write a contract that would that would be the legal knowledge as would be the only institution involved. But what, what we do is we can um, we can provide an award letter so that um, there is something formal in place. So we would do that, um, just write a, a, basically a letter of what the requirements of the PI was and so on. Um, so at least uh, you know, there's something sort of in writing. Um, but we don't actually have a contract because in, in that instance, no, well, no money would be going outside of the University of Edinburgh. Um, and so the contract wouldn't actually itself mean anything. Uh, yeah, I should have mentioned that. So. Does that answer that that question? Thanks, Moritz. Any any further questions? Do you have to nominate somebody from the EPC staff? If you want somebody from the EPC to keep security or jury stay or one of your many, your many co-developers can do You can do either. And, um, and yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I just said, 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 just Oh, oh, if you, if you, if you want to have from, from EPC, do you have to you nominate, have to nominate an, an actual named person, or can you just say that you want somebody from the team? And I was just saying the answer to that is you, you don't actually have to name someone. There's an option just to say you want effort from the CSC team and list the skills requirement. However, the other option is you, in advance of submission, if you come to us, then we'll identify, we'll look to identify someone relevant and name them on the actual proposal. So you can do both, is the answer. Thanks, Glenn. Is there any other questions? I think that's a no, unless somebody's rapidly typing and we're not. Um, if you have any questions after the session's finished, then um, the Archer Help Desk is the best place to, to send them. We will we'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, in that case, uh, we'll wrap up. Um, but as I say, any further questions, to send them into the Archer Help Desk and we'll, we'll get back to you as quickly as we can. Um, the, obviously, the earlier before the closing date uh, you do that, the better, because 
Um, in the last few days, there can sometimes be quite a lot of questions, and it can be quite difficult to get through them all. But um, uh, you know, the earlier the better. But please, please just go ahead and ask. Um, otherwise, I think we'll finish there. And thank you all for coming along. Uh, I hope you found that useful. And if you're putting in a proposal, uh, best of luck with it. And uh, we look forward to receiving it. Okay. Right. Thank you.